Did anybody see the clouds last night after that storm? <laughs> it's just amazing how, how great of an artist our God is, how, how beautiful his creation is <laughs> in the way that he intended it to be created. <sighs> Let the people flow back in here real quick and have you ever wondered, uh, Lord, I, I find myself praying this sometimes, Lord, what could I do to better serve you? What could I do differently that I'm not doing now? Um, and what my, what my goal is today here, I think what the Lord's trying to speak, uh, hopefully I can give some ideas in that. Um, so the question, the real question, the root of the question is, how could I be a more effective disciple of Jesus? How could I, uh, how could I be a better disciple than I was yesterday? How could I grow? Um, so, with that being said, the first question would be, what is a disciple? So, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a disciple is one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another. So, of course, the, the another here is referring to Jesus. Okay, so being a disciple of Jesus means we first accept. This is, a, this is a bifid definition. It's got two parts. Okay, we accept first. That's the very premise of Christian faith. We have to accept our Lord. Um, so, starting right here, we, we've got to stop and talk about something. Okay, I have to be completely clear. We are not saved by our works. We are not saved by the things we do. The only way we are saved is by first accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and then by believing in our hearts and uh, proclaiming it with our mouths, um, we are saved by grace through faith. So, please do not hear this message as this is how you get saved. Okay, the things that I'm going to talk about today are the works. Uh, it's, it's not how you are saved. So, with that being said, our works are the things that are the fruit of our salvation. Okay, we are first, we first believe and accept, and then the second part of the definition, we spread. Okay, so the first element of an effective disciple is effective disciples create more disciples. Um, if you want to, go ahead and turn with me to 1 first, first Thessalonians 2. Um, this was something that, that came up with me this week. I was reading, uh, I believe one of the verses of the day came up, and it was in 1 uh, Thessalonians 2. And I just, I felt like this really fit the what I was trying to convey today. Um, now this is Paul speaking here. It says, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put a mask on and cover up, to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for the praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though, as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we have, like, we were like young children among you. So I really want to focus in on verse 4 there. It says, On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So as a disciple of Christ, we have been entrusted with something very, very important. We have been given something that people before us didn't have. The people of the Old Testament did not have this gospel that we have, nor the opportunity. Um, so, what are we supposed to do with this gospel? What are we supposed to do with this valuable thing that we've been entrusted with? 
Well, the second part of the definition. We are supposed to spread that. Spread the word, the good news. It's great news, right? So Matthew 28, 8, uh, 19 through 20, referring here to the, the Great Commission. Okay, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded with you commanded you and surely I'm with you to the very end of the age so an effective disciple creates more disciples now how do we do that so has anybody ever heard the expression if you give a man a fish he'll eat for a day but if you teach a man to fish he'll eat for a lifetime okay I, I think that's very applicable to our Christian faith see we have an opportunity here as disciples, uh, as, as people who have been trusted with the gospel, to not just give a man a fish, but to teach a man to fish. And in turn, they're going to eat for a lifetime. Um, so how do we do that? Well, the first, first and obvious way is through evangelism. Okay, one, more, one, one way to create more disciples is by simply leading people to the Lord, leading new people to the Lord. Now, we should not see this, and I think oftentimes in our faith, uh, we start to see this as a job uh, rather than what it actually is. What it is is an opportunity. We have, we have been entrusted. I, can't, I cannot stress that enough, that we have been trusted with something so valuable we have been trusted with this, so it's an opportunity for us. Okay, think back. Remember when you first got saved? You remember how excited you were? I mean, I was so excited, I was telling everybody I knew, look what happened, look what happened, this is, this is what Jesus did for me. Now, <laughs> thinking about that though, here lately, uh, I remember a sermon that was preached here. I think Pastor Marty gave the message. It was called Getting Back to a First Love Relationship. Okay, I was convicted by that because I had started to see evangelism and uh, the work of the Lord as more of a chore than, it was, than an opportunity. That's not the right thinking. That is not what the Lord wants for us. Um, so thinking back to that first love relationship, and how excited I was when I first accepted the Lord and first, you know, I, what happened? You know, slowly the burdens of life start to pile on. And uh, uh, I know a saying at work is you never want to get complacent. Complacency is a very dangerous thing. Um, so complacency in your faith, in turn, is also a very dangerous thing. We do not want to get to where, you know, it's just, okay, what's next? Okay, we'll just go through the motions. We'll, you know, I'll show up on Sunday. I got to go and I got to make coffee, even though I don't know how to use the big scoop. And, um, you know, it's, it's frustrating. And <laughs> that happened this morning, by the way. Uh, <laughs> But I want you to ask yourself today, are you excited about being a disciple of Christ? Are you excited about your faith right now? Are you excited just to have the opportunity to be here this morning? The Lord's yoke is light. It's, it's, it's not a chore. It's not um, a burden. It's light. He, he wants us to enjoy our life. He has given us this life to enjoy. Um, now, with that being said, I don't, I don't believe that God wants His people to be complacent or dull in their faith. God wants His people to wake up every single morning and say, Okay, Lord, what are you going to do through me today? Each day is a new day, and we have an opportunity each morning, like Patrick was saying, just showing up here early and spending 
Any day that you start with the Lord is going to be a good day. Any day that you start with the Lord is going to be a great day. Um, and to, to even go further from that, many people think that the Christian life is a boring life. You know, people see, oh, well, you can't do all this stuff, and you can't do... People see the restrictions, but they could not be more wrong. Okay? Life with the Lord is one of the most exciting and interesting lives that, that you could live. Because it's always unexpected. It's a roller coaster ride. And nobody, you can't frown on a roller coaster. <laughs> Come on. But the thing is, we have to let go of the control and give, give the Lord the control and let him drive. That's the key. So the second way that you can uh, create more disciples is through being a spiritual parent. Okay, so another amazing opportunity as we uh, grow in our faith and we mature and uh, we, we begin to start getting opportunities to become a spiritual parent to someone else. Okay, what do I mean by that? Uh, another word that I, I think I could explain that is a faith mentor. You have the opportunity to mentor somebody in their faith. Um, so going back, you know, like I said, we've got an exciting thing. I missed this point, and I want to go back and say, say this, but uh, back to evangelism. Seeing people come to the Lord is a very exciting thing. Okay, seeing people accept Christ. I remember when we were here uh, not too long ago, and we saw a young man just give it all up. How amazing was that? I mean, just watching that happen, even just being in the room, you felt the Holy Spirit here. You could feel the Lord was just, just laying His hand on that kid and saying, okay, it's okay, man. I've got you. You're in my hands now. Um, I also remember one night, <laughs> I was sitting. we were sitting in the living room, me and my wife, and we were watching a movie. I think it was War Room. I can't remember off the top of my head, really, but um, there was a part in the movie where somebody had come and, to know the Lord. They had accepted Christ for the first time. And um, anyway, you know, I always make fun of my wife. Why you cry at movies? It's fake. You know, why? Well, anyway, I started to tear up. So I thought, okay, <laughs> what am I going to do now? So I started, I blew my nose, you know, and acted like everything was all right. And I went to the bathroom to go, to go, <laughs> to go catch myself. And but anyway, you know, it's just, <laughs> yeah, okay, I can't say, oh, why, why are you crying at a movie? And then cry at a movie. Um, <laughs> but the, the, seeing someone commit their life to Christ is such an exciting and emotional thing. Because you know, you just gained another brother or sister in Christ. So, back to being a spiritual parent. Um, I often think about this, you know, when, when someone older than me is talking, I love spending time with grandparents and uh, even, you know, just people who have lived more life than me. You know, I like to just sit there and listen to them talk and you know, just absorb it all. Um, because, like I said, they've lived more life than us. They've had experiences that we haven't had the opportunity to have. Um, now, what's really amazing to think about is if we could stop and learn from the things that they have went through, learn from their experiences, we could save ourselves so much time, so much heartache, so much effort, if we could simply just listen and learn. Think about the people who were with Moses during the Exodus. Okay, these people had lived for years and years and years under terrible conditions. The Egyptians, you know, they were enslaved to the Egyptian people. And then Moses comes along and says, hey, let's go. I'm going to send these plagues. Uh, the Lord's going to send these plagues on the Egyptians and we're going to go. So anyway, the day comes and they're leaving Egypt. He parts the Red Sea. You know, these people had the opportunity to see so, so many amazing things. They saw the Lord working firsthand. Okay? They saw a sea split in half. Think about that. 
How amazing would that be to be going down in the Mississippi River just... That'd be amazing, right? Now, think about how they, they started wandering in the desert, okay? And then eventually it got to the point where they were like, okay, Moses, I'm tired of this manna. You know, okay, first of all, I'm tired of this manna. The Lord is feeding them spiritually, and you know, I'm tired of it. You know, I'm, it's, I'm bored. I want something different. I'm thirsty. Let's just go back to Egypt. Let's just go back. Did they learn anything from Moses? Now, on the other hand, think about Elijah and Elisha. Okay, Elijah was a mentor to Elisha. And as they go, you know, they go along and Elisha sees Elijah do so many awesome things. And uh, 2 Kings 2.9, it says, on the other, or it says uh, ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Okay, this was Elijah speaking to Elisha, saying, you know, the time is coming. I'm getting ready to get taken up, and what do you, what do you, would you like me to do anything for you? Ask. All you have to do is ask. And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Okay, so Elijah was Elisha's spiritual father. And... That, that double double portion was definitely on Elisha. If you read on through the Kings, and um, it's just it's amazing. Okay, now what to note here is Elisha listened and learned. Unlike the people of Israel at the time when they were going through the Exodus. Um, have you ever heard the term? Pay it forward. Okay? This is another good picture. When we are going through the Christian life and we have the opportunity to mentor somebody, that is paying it forward. Okay? So we're going to mentor this person. This person is going to mentor this per person. This person is going to mentor this person. And it's just a long chain. So if we could actually listen and learn, we could be so much further ahead. Um, and, you know, you're... You're not only, you're not, it's a selfless act, okay? See, if you're mentoring somebody, it is obedience on two parts, okay? First, the person who's mentoring has to, okay, so Elijah and Elisha. Think about it. Elijah first had to hear the call that he needed to mentor Elisha, okay? He had to listen to that, and he had to do that. He had to then act after he heard that. And the second thing is, Elisha had to hear from the Lord to Listen, he had to put himself and obey the Lord in following Elijah. So we get a double uh, obedience. Now, the second element, uh, effective disciples know the word and they apply it. Okay, Hebrews 4.12 says, for the, Lord, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Okay, so just like Pastor Greg was talking about during the graduation, the PTS graduation here a couple weeks ago, and just like we had talked about before, we have something that has been trusted to us. Okay, it's not a butter knife. It's not something that you just spread a little bit on top. It's a sharp, double-edged sword. So as a disciple of Jesus, we have an obligation to not only know what the Bible says, but to live it out, to, to apply it to our lives. First way we do that is by knowing the Word. We have to know the Word to apply it. The only way that we can know the Word is to be in it every day. The only way that we can, uh, being in the Word is the only way to know it. Now, is that an easy thing? Absolutely not. I fail all the time. Um, but I think that's also something that we as disciples need to know. 
We have to be disciplined to be a disciple of Christ. Okay, it's not, not, it's not, a, it's not a coincidence that the first six letters of disciple and discipline are the exact same. Think about that. D-I-S-C-I-P-L-E. D-I-S-C-I-P-L-I-N-E. I had to catch myself there. <laughs> um, so with that point, we have to know the word, and then the second part comes in, we have to apply it to our lives. If you profess your faith as a Christian, there are people watching you. Every single day, somebody is watching you, and because they know. If, if you profess it, they know that you're a Christian, and they're going to be watching you, okay? That's why living out your faith and not just speaking it is so important. So this is going to be kind of rapid fire here, but going through, uh, you don't have to turn with me, but 1 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore I urge you to imitate me. Okay, we'll turn back to that one. Again in 11.1 it says, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Okay, and then again in uh, Philippians 3, it says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as, he, just as you have us as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. And then, one more time in 2 Thessalonians 3, it says, we did, not, or we did this not because we do, do not have the rights to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. Okay, here's Paul in three separate epistles and four separate uh, verses here echoing the exact same message. Imitate me. So as a disciple of Christ, we have uh, the obligation, we have first been entrusted with the gospel. Okay. Second, we have the opportunity to be evangelists. We have an opportunity to lead people to the Lord. Third, we have the opportunity to be a spiritual parent. And I want to go on in 1 Corinthians uh, 4, and it's titled, The Nature of True Dis Apostleship. It says, I'm sorry, Yeah, 416. It says, uh, before that, I am writing this to you, not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Okay, I became your spiritual father. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. That is why living out your faith is so important. Because we have the opportunity and the obligation to set an example for people to follow. Okay? Imitate me, Paul says. So, so many different places. <laughs> I think the Lord's trying to say something there. It wouldn't be so many, and to speaking to three separate groups of people, imitate me. How easy is it, uh, going back to applying the word, how easy is it to say, I forgive somebody? Okay? Words are easy, but when the rubber meets the road, and it's, it's time to actually apply that, that's a whole different act. Okay? So how easy is it to say, I forgive this person, but a couple months down the road, something happens, and, well, remember when you did this, so did you really forgive that person? I love the saying, if you can talk the talk, you better be able to walk the walk. That, is, that rings so true to this message. Effective disciples know the word and they apply it. So element three. Effective disciples are with the Father and people can tell that they have been with the Father. Think about Moses in Exodus 34. Go ahead and turn with me to Exodus 34 here. Um, this, this passage is, 
titled The Radiant Face of Moses. It says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. So when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands that the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses was finished ta- speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak to him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites what he had been commanded. They saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went back in to speak with the Lord. So Moses, his face was radiant. Now why? Look at verses 29 and 30. It said... When Moses came down from the mount, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. Okay, he had been in the presence of God, and he was his his appearance was physically altered from being in the presence of the Lord. Uh, It was actually altered so much that people were afraid to even come near him. Um, Now, the the word, the Hebrew word for radiant actually means, it it physically means to protrude rays, to shoot out rays. So it wasn't just saying, you know, Moses was radiant. He was happy because he had been with the Lord. He was was glowing. You know, we say that so often. No, he was actually physically glowing. People were freaked out. Okay, this guy just came off this mountain, and his face is like a flashlight. They were afraid because they knew that he had been in the presence of the Lord. And they were afraid because... If you remember a couple chapters back, they had built a golden calf. Okay, they were afraid because Moses had been in the presence. Now, one one other thing that makes this so amazing is the fact that Moses should not have looked good at all. Moses was 80 years old when the Israelites were on Mount Sinai. Okay, this 80-year-old man climbed up a mountain, which is... That would make headlines today, okay? 80-year-old, 80-year-old man climbs mountain. I can see that in the news. It's, it's amazing, okay? Now, not only did this 80-year-old man climb a mountain, he then fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, that's a long time. 40 days without food and water is a long time. Then, he climbs back down the mountain after not eating for 40 days. He has to deal with all the stress of these, these Israelites, his people that he has been entrusted with creating an, an idol. So he has to rebuke them. He has to deal with all that stress that's going on. Okay, then this 80-year-old man, he turns around and he heads right back up the mountain. He fasts for 40 more days and then climbed back down the second time. So 80 days in all that he fasted. Think about that. 80 days without food and water. That's amazing. Moses should not have been in very good shape then. But he was in the presence of the Lord. His presence had been physically altered. So people could tell that he had been with the Father. Uh, And I also would like to talk about the section in Acts. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's 416 maybe. Uh, Anyway, it's talking about when... uh, Peter and John went before the Sanhedrin. It said, and they noted that he was, they were, these men had been with Jesus. People could tell that these men had been with Jesus. So, what could hold us back from being an effective disciple? Maybe fear. I think fear is one of the biggest uh, setbacks that we have. Fear Failure? Maybe failure is keeping us from doing it. Well, I tried it once and I didn't do it. So I'm just going to go back to being comfortable and just go sit back in my seat and not worry about it. Or maybe it's fear of failure. Fear of failing again. 
when we fail, we have an opportunity to grow, okay? If we always did everything right, would there, would there be any need to grow? Would there be any need for a Savior? We're going to fail. But when we fail, we have to embrace that. Um, maybe it's pride that's getting in our way. C.S. Lewis said that a proud man cannot know God, for a proud man is always looking down on others. And how can he see what is above if he is always looking down? How can I see the reflection on, of God on someone who is so full of themselves, thinking that they are so holy and proud of it that they are just looking down at the rest of us? For if they are looking down, they cannot reflect from their faces from which, that which is above. So think for a second about the sun and the moon. Okay, the moon literally has no light. It is not a source of light. The sun is the only source of light for the moon. The moon simply reflects the sun's light. Hear that. The moon reflects the sun's light. We need to be reflecting the sun's light. We need to take that opportunity that we've been given. We need to live a life that is worthy of of the calling and the trust that we have been given, and we need to reflect that. Bacteria grows and multiplies through a process called binary fission, which is basically a fancy word that means one cell splits into two. Okay, separate cells. Now, because bacteria can grow this way, only if the conditions are right, uh, they, have, they have the ability to grow at an exponential rate. Okay, so that means if the number of cells that survive after the split, if, if both cells survive, then the growth curve starts here, and it starts slow, and then it goes straight up. Okay, think about that. Two becomes two, becomes two, becomes two, becomes two. Now, this only happens if the conditions are right. So that means the temperature has to be right, the... the pH has to be at the right level. The nutrients have to be there. There's no presence of toxins. Um, now, an infection happens when bacteria enter somebody's body. Okay, once again, this can only happen if the conditions are right. Then, the inspection, infection can spread from one person to the next. Okay? Once it starts spreading from person to person to person to person, then we have an outbreak. Once that outbreak hits a certain point, then it's an epidemic. So, that being said, uh, let's look at the conditions of our society as a whole. We have taken God out of our schools. We have families that have been broken apart. We glorify promiscuity. We have been consumed by greed. And we continue to grow further and further away from morality as a society, as a, as a nation. We have created the right environment for sin and hate to grow at an exponential rate. We are seeing the effects of that today. We have an epidemic on our hands. The infection has been here ever since Adam and Eve. Okay, when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, the infection started there. But it has continued to grow and grow and grow, and to this point, we have an epidemic. So what can we do about that? As disciples of Jesus, it's time for us to take a stand, to stop the conditions of hate, of sin, to take a stand. We need to harbor an environment of love, acceptance, and forgiveness rather than hate. Um, we need to be effective disciples, not ticket punchers or seat fillers. We need to be effective disciples of Jesus. Matthew West has a song called Do Something. Okay, there's a, there's a lyric in that song. I love it. It goes like this. I turned my eyes to heaven, and I thought, God, why don't you do something? 
How often do we have that thought? Lord, why don't you just do something? Why don't you stop that? The next part is really where it hits me. He said, I did. I created you. We were put here to be difference makers. We were put here to be effective disciples. So, we need to start today. What's holding you back from being an effective disciple? You might not know, the, it, this might not make sense to some people. Okay, this, this might have been a message uh, that was not... Um, not suited for uh, unbelievers or new Christians, but I, I'm telling you today, if you don't know Jesus, this is an opportunity for you as well to come to know him. He wants to use you in a way that will change the world. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get the music ready again. Um... We have an epidemic on our hands, folks. It's time right now. Let's ask ourselves, what can we do? How could we be more effective disciples? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you today for the, uh, just your love and your mercy, your grace, Lord. We just thank you so much for the opportunity to be here right now. Father, we just pray right now that you would just give us a heart to serve, a heart to uh, just do your will. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done in our lives already, all that you're going to continue to do. And we just, just worship you right now. Just thank you. We give you all the honor and all the glory for everything we do, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.